me start by introducing Jason Whitaker. Jason is your president-elect, and Jason has put together a panel of folks from the different wireless carriers, and you, we will be talking to them about the different wireless provision and services that they offer for, uh, for cell service and other types of service. Jason. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I don't know if the vendors can hear me, but I just want you guys to know, hello vendors, that you are loud. And we appreciate you being here, but if you could calm it down a little bit, that would be great. Thank you. So we're here this afternoon. We want to welcome everyone. Um, I've been reaching out to several wireless uh, vendors to see if we could get them here to this panel to speak to us. I've got some questions for them. And uh, hopefully you have some questions for them too. So we're going to open the floor for questions here uh, near the end of this session. I want to introduce them first. I'm really bad with introductions. But um, starting on the left, we have Sprint with us. This is Paul Worsland. Did I say that right? He is uh, their solutions engineer. And this is Christy Derryberry. She is director of government, public sector management, all the above for Sprint, and we appreciate them coming. In the middle, we have Verizon. This is Mark Boggs. He is a um, s director of data solutions. Uh, I guess is that for North Carolina or for North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. And at the end of the table, not, not least and last, okay, um, we have Ed White. He's the government account manager here. And on the very end, we have Paul Denham, and he's their mobile app manager. So we hope to have some good discussions today. I want to kick this off by saying, um, you know, I think it's a safe bet for all these wireless carriers that everybody's going to have a smartphone one day. Raise your hand in this room if you do not have a smartphone. Neil, I'm very disappointed. So there was like two, maybe three, okay? Um, I think it's safe to say, especially with IT people, we're moving that way. And I just want to tell you, this couple weeks ago, I finally got my wife a smartphone. And my motive was that um, she would use the GPS. And there's a lot behind that. And she likes the GPS and she uses it and I feel better. Um, but I would get calls from anywhere saying, can you look this up and tell me where I'm at and where I need to go? So that's good, but I'll, I'll say this, I've had a smartphone for what, eight years or more, and I have never went over one gigabyte of data usage. My wife got her phone two weeks ago, we are already over two gigs. And um, I don't know who to thank for that, I think it's Pinterest, I don't know if anybody are Pinterest fans, that's my guess. And uh, I really don't know where the data's gone, but uh, it's very interesting how that works out. So without delaying any further, we're going to start um, with the first question. You know, we have, just so you'll know, in this room and around, there's roughly 300 government IT professionals in the room, government as well as schools, uh, uh, in education, um, and others. And um, so this is a good chance for us all to get together. Uh, we always. We always seem to have the same needs uh, and the same issues arise with everything, including wireless communications. The first question is about coverage, and uh, I think this is, after actually kind of warning around, this has already popped up several times today about coverage. Um, and I won't tell you what vendor that I have, what wireless carrier I'm using, but it is because they are the only one that I can use where I live and still be able to talk on the phone between the work and the house, okay? So coverage is a very important issue. Um, those in Cary and Raleigh and Charlotte probably don't have the issues like some of us in more rural areas. So our first question, this is funny. This, you, you know, if you shake your iPad or your phone, it, it pops up and wants you to do an undo, like if you're in Microsoft Word or something. So this thing keeps, every time I shake it, it's wanting to know if I want to undo my last move. It's going to drive me crazy. First question we have, and we're going to start, I think we'll start down here on, on the end. Um, we're going to ask, please take a minute to briefly discuss your 3G, 4G coverage of North Carolina, citing 
the strongest to weakest areas and include your plans for coverage expansion in the next two years. So you'll have just a minute or two, and if you would, pass the mic down, and we'll go that way, and the next time we'll start in the middle with, with Mike. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for having us today, and um, also we'd love for you to come visit us at our booth uh, right over there if you have any additional questions after the seminar. First of all, we've, we've had a, a monumental year in 4G rollout. Um, we've rolled out uh, 4G in Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, uh, Chapel Hill, Burlington, Greensboro, uh, Winston-Salem, Wilmington, Fayetteville. And um, of course, I'm, I'm just talking strictly on North Carolina here. Uh, we currently provide the largest 4G HSPA Plus network in the state of North Carolina. and. Um, we offer in our network a, an overlaying process that uh, allows us to handle speeds faster, and that's uh, using the uh, AS, HSPA Plus on pretty much all of our 3G network that we have out there today. Um, we currently are um, providing uh, Ethernet um, deployment to all of our sites so that we can provide faster data speeds uh, around the state. And I would say that um, the coverage that we have today is, is the worst that you'll ever see it. I love to say that because um, as we constantly move forward with our deployment of cell sites and network, uh, it's going to do nothing but get greater. Uh, Currently, we uh, we're offer uh, over 275 million pops around the country. So we're providing 3,000 uh, more 4G cities than any other carrier out there in the, in the country. So uh, we will have our spots in North and South Carolina, but what I will say that we are deploying every day and uh, trying to cover any kind of spot, any kind of uh, areas that uh, don't have good coverage uh, between this year and next year. We should have most everything filled out. Thank you. That was Sprint, by the way, and then we'll pass the mic. I mean, uh, was at t, t I'm sorry. And, and we didn't bring boxing gloves. Maybe I, I should have so they can beat me up. Uh, we have Mark from Verizon. Um, you guys are familiar with our coverage. We're pretty public about it. Um, we've always looked at the network as the product. Everything else is uh, secondary. So if um, our maps are updated pretty currently. If you want to know any specific spots, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, we have uh, also deployed a large 4G deployment over the last several years. It's uh, LTE from the ground up. It's, uh, if you're not familiar with that technology, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But it's, um, it's another global technology that's on the rise. It's being largely adopted across our country and across the globe. So. We feel like it's not only a uh, quality technology, but we also have a huge strategic advantage in the deployment of that technology. Um, there are different flavors of 4G. Um, not all 4Gs are the same. Um, we even may call some, you know, we've heard of faux fur and faux leather. Some networks are faux G. So um, you got to keep that in mind when you're looking at really what you're getting with your speed and your coverage. Um, as far as 3G to 4G, you guys know what our 3G coverage is on a 4G level. Um, again, LTE, we've got about 80% of our 3G network uh, covered with 4G here. The region, I, when I refer to the Carolinas, Tennessee, that's kind of the geography that I live and breathe in. So in that geography, we're 75-80% we're built out. Um, we have no plans of slowing down. We, we're going to keep pushing forward. We've, uh, we understand that all of our competitors are um, hot on our heels and have no intention of sitting around um, while we continue to build. So I think in the next... Right now, from an LTE perspective, we have a monstrous lead on everyone. Um, I don't think that'll be the same conversation a year from now. I think the, the maps are constantly changing. <clears throat> As you just heard, I think uh, when you look at true maps, the, the white spots, which indicate no coverage, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, with our LTE coverage, we do have the only contiguous license to build LTE in the country. It's coast to coast. It's contiguous. We have the right to build it anywhere we choose to build it. So the notion of a truly ubiquitous LTE network um, 
is very much a possibility and is likely a reality. So um, we're that's where we go. So I, I think I've used most of my time on that. Thank you. And and now Sprint. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Jason. And thank you for inviting us here. When we arrived, we weren't on the program, so we weren't really sure if we we're going to be sitting up here. But since we're here, um, actually our coverage is getting smaller. No, I just want to get out that big elephant in the room. You probably think of Sprint and Nextel as being together. And to be honest, uh, the Nextel network we have announced is being de decommissioned next year. Is that a surprise to everyone? Is that a surprise? I hope not. Of course, that I'm just trying to add some humor here to what's going to be a very fun day. <laughs> but what is getting stronger is the Sprint CDMA network. Um, as, as the speaker before me just said, we also have Spectrum nationally to, to roll out LTE. I think what he, what he meant to say is they have the only continuous spectrum at 700 megahertz. But we, we indeed have also continuous spectrum to roll out LTE. And in fact, uh, Sprint has just announced in the last, since in September, that there are several markets in North Carolina where LTE will starting to be show up by the end of the year. To give you an example of our Charlotte deployment, um, by January of next year, we'll have 53% of our sites in, in Charlotte covered with LTE, and 81% of our sites will also be having this new infrastructure technology that we're calling Network Vision that will not only give our existing customers 70% stronger signal through the new of new radios and the new infrastructure our network. That is primarily how our network is growing, through that network vision infrastructure that gives that more powerful signal. But we're also taking something from Nextel. Nextel, where it, where it was really powerful, was in the 800 megahertz frequencies that were used. And that's, nothing, that's something that Sprint Network, the CDMA network, has not been able to use before. So our Sprint network in the next, you know, like I said, 81% of our sites in Charlotte by January will have a more powerful signal because we can now include 800 megahertz, and that's where Sprint has been at a disadvantage. A more powerful signal, of course, gives you stronger coverage between sites, gives you better coverage in buildings, and that's where something that's, to be honest, where Sprint has been lagging. So that's something that you'll see a huge advantage for Sprint and able to offer that type of coverage where Nextel had that before. I think that okay. answers the Thank question. you. If you'll pass it over to uh, Mark in the middle with Verizon. Our next question is to describe your network infrastructure in terms of stability, saturation, speed, and any future enhancements planned for the next year or so. And you've already touched on some of that, but maybe um, there seems to be a lot of confusion about the actual speeds of, in your case, LTE or, or 4G. Um, you go somewhere, it might be 7 megs or you go somewhere else. I was in Houston and I was pulling down 30 some megs. So maybe you guys can address that too. What makes those, the difference in speeds in these cases? Sure, and um, one correction, you're absolutely right. Um, the contigu contiguous coverage that we have is in the 700 megahertz frequency. So there are other frequencies that um, have licenses. Um, to your point, uh, we treat our network holistically. So uh, we not only focus extremely on the radio side, which is the last mile, but we also uh, focus heavily internally on the stability. Um, with the 4G radio network, we've also upgraded our infrastructure um, to be fully IP, to have fiber to the cell sites. So we're, we're making the same investments. I think we all are making the same investments there. Um, so that's, that's the, you can't separate the two. I think in the past, when it was more voice-centric networks, you could separate kind of your infrastructure and the radio. You really can't anymore. The content's driving that. Um, the usage, the demands, the, the one and two gig a month uh, are driving that you have to treat those two holistically. As far as stability, um, we've got a really good reputation. Uh, I'm sure some of you in here know firsthand. Um, we've been in a lot, unfortunately, a lot of um, disasters where we've had to prove that our stuff really works. Um, Part of our credo as a company is we run two disasters, we don't run away from them. And we've proven that time and time again. Uh, recently, uh, with Hurricane Irene, I mean, we had an example over in Kinston where the entire EMS went down. And uh, we ended up being heavily engaged in keeping the operations running. And I think there's probably stories like that across the way. So we, we take the responsibility. That network is something that a lot of people rely on. And it's everything from end users to 
um, first responders and public safeties and everybody in between. So we see that as a vital responsibility. It's a resource to our communities. We take that very seriously. Um, that's why we have not only battery backups at all our cell sites, we have generators at almost every cell site that we're allowed to have them at. Um, we have regular uh, drills. We have uh, backup redundancy. If any of you guys want a, a tour, we can arrange that. But we have amazing redundancy in our switch facilities. Um, we have fleets of vehicles, colts and cows. We put all these cool names on them, sell on wheels and sell on light trucks and uh, generators on trucks, they're goats. So we got all these farm name animals for, for all this gear. But we, the point is we have a lot of gear that we can deploy and we bring that out when we need it. Um, and typically you'll see if, if there's a hurricane, if there's a natural disaster and stuff's going out, you'll see our trucks rolling against traffic. We're heading in most of the time. We stage that, we plan for that. We work very closely with all our municipalities, particularly power to make sure we have arrangements to, to get our network up and running as quickly as possible because in a lot of cases, we're co-dependent customers. So that's where we are. As far as speed, um, 4G speeds can vary widely. It, it depends on a lot of things. It could be um, the, the radio. It could be the, the infrastructure back. It could be the volume of traffic on it. So it's hard to pinpoint. Um, you guys are engineers, you'll appreciate it. So many times we go and look for something. And in wireless, I've laughed for a dozen years now. It's almost like voodoo or something. Just to give you an example, um, in addition to planning for Ethernet backhaul and everything else with Network Vision, just in North Carolina alone, we have had to make almost 912 T1 augments throughout the North Carolina network just this year so far, just to keep up with ongoing demand for voice and for data and everything else. And that is exponential growth over previous years, and all these carriers um, can, can really talk to that. So what we're doing now is trying to keep up, keep up adding T1s. Uh, through the end of this year, we're going to be adding 447 more for data, 217 more for voice, and it just keeps going up. So what we're trying to do now is we're all trying to keep up, trying to get to that net network vision platform that will be at every cell site so we can be more flexible with backhaul and everything else. When we do shut Nextel down, in addition to getting more spectrum at 800 megahertz, we're able to keep that capacity game flowing. Um, we are all always looking for capacity. You know, when the FCC and Sprint and Dish Network, you might have seen, try to get together and say, let's try to reorganize, let's try to figure out where you guys can get new spectrum that we can auction off for several billion dollars, because I hear our government needs some money right now. Where, where can we find that for you all so now you can offer connections out to subscribers? You don't just need to have that backhaul connectivity into Ethernet and T1s but you need to have that spectrum to serve everyone. So that's where Sprint and getting the 800 megahertz spectrum from Nextel and being able to reuse that in the CDMA network is really gonna be growing strong. Um, we have, of course, Clearwire as a partner that's gonna be helping us out in hotspots uh, of, of 4G LTE. They're gonna be deploying LTE coverage in the major markets where they have deployments now in North Carolina, but to give, give Sprint an offload of a LTE technology so really in those high capacity areas. So we're always gonna try to stay ahead of the, the data game. Like, the, like Jason said earlier, um, his wife is driving new applications to the network with now video chat and other things being, oh, I can do that on my iPhone now or I couldn't before. That two gig plan or whatever you have is gonna be running out. So what is the carrier trying to do with it? We're trying to keep up primarily from the spectrum game. I'm going to say one quick thing about emergency response, which I know a lot of you have known me for many years now, and it's something that was always near and dear to our heart. I think our fleet of SAT Colts now is 12. We'll hover them anything that the Air Force can fly, we can create coverage anywhere. And one of the conversations that I still really like to have 
and the public safety community is let, let us come in and let every carrier come in and talk about their capabilities. Not what you use day in and day out, but let's, let's do a better job of preparing. Let's make sure that we, if you have tabletop exercises, if you want to do school shooting scenarios, we still offer go kits where you can pay you know, a minimal amount per month or per year to have phone numbers that will be activated only in the case of an emergency for your you know for pre-planning and publication of those numbers and things of that nature. So emergency response is something that we've been doing a long time and it's near and dear to our heart. So it's always a topic I like to talk about too. Reverse this time. Oh you didn't I see this little right <laughs> We're, you know, I don't know which way we're passing across the, the, the pews, but um, anyway, um, okay, so, uh, you know, what we're trying to do uh, for us moving forward is, is we're trying to set ourselves up for the future, and obviously there's a couple of things that's driving our business, and, and that's data consumption, as we all have heard, and then the ownership of Spectrum. And uh, our LTE deployment, which is our 4, uh, 4G AH, ASPH Plus, has uh, been deployed in all the major cities in North Carolina. And, um, you know, I, I was talking to Paul the other day, and, and he got a 65 megabyte download in Raleigh. So, um, uh, closer to Charlotte, sorry. Anyway, uh, so, so you're going to see speeds that are just crazy across the board until we start seeing loading of those networks and, and then things will start changing again. But uh, obviously the things that we're trying to do right now is, is trying to fulfill our backhaul issues, which are our ethernet issues that we're trying to take care of. Uh, we're at about 67% deployed with our LTE deployment in North Carolina. And um, uh, to tell you the, some of the things that we're trying to do to make sure that you guys uh, get a, um, the quality of service that you're looking for is even in, during disasters, we have generators on, uh, on trailers. We have cows sell on wheels that can be deployed instantly. And um, a disaster that, um, that didn't take place, but it was a great e um, uh, experiment for us uh, was the Democratic Convention in Charlotte. And um, if you guys were involved in any of that, you'll know that um, uh, Charlotte uh, is probably one of the most blessed cities in the country because of uh, the money that was spent by wireless carriers trying to build up that network there uh, for the convention. But, you know, AT&T has spent over $115 billion in our network in acquiring Spectrum and uh, over the last five years trying to, trying to um, get up to standards that we expect should be happening in the next year or two. Um, you know, we have, uh, our network is constantly monitored 24-7 in a knock that, uh, that is constantly looking for I issues at any cell site, with any radio within the cell site, and, uh, and can be alerted, technicians can go out um, within a matter of moments. Um, and I think, I think the other thing is, is, is the, uh, the, we're seeing a, a tremendous um, a growth um, outcrop of our network uh, into uh, areas called uh, DAZs, or distributed antenna systems within, um, within buildings. And, and we're, we're developing, we have a whole team of people that travel around the country and, and install uh, systems within buildings and uh, to enhance the, uh, the coverage within buildings too. So uh, we're doing uh, a lot of different phases trying to answer some of those uh, coverage and, and um, technology questions. So the next question is, this group is all about sharing. Just for instance, um, Jason Clay, are you in here? I think I saw you earlier from the city of Newton, right? He's here somewhere. He'd, um, he'd done a lot of wireless work, not with cellular, just, just network related throughout the city. And he put on a little show at his place a few weeks ago and invited to open it up. And I think the Nickel Jesus group paid for lunch and so. And that is really rewarding for us. So 
Um, could you share with, with us, starting with um, Sprint at the end? I get you confused. I'm sorry. Um, basically, as far as a government entity that you have worked with, that you are proud of the installation, that um, would be a good showcase of your equipment and, and use of your apps and data and speed and your network, could you share with us who you would probably choose maybe out of North Carolina? That's an interesting question. For Not me. to pick favorites. No, no, no. That's an interesting question for me right now. As Paul just made a joke about our ever shrinking network, so I can look across the room and see people that I have been heavily partnered with over the last decade that perhaps I'm not so much so now. Um, we have you know, some work to do. We're outlining our progress and our steps with that for you today a little bit. So I've had, I mean, from Wilson to Asheville, I've had console integrations. I've worked with public safety dispatch on radio designs. We were among the first to do a location-based services kind of offering with uh, different data partners. As soon as we had to be E911 compliant, we thought, you know, well, we can use this information for for other things besides, um, you know, for for PSAP and for the public safety community and the citizen community. So applications and things like that. And, and but one of the one of when I heard this question and when I read this question, I thought. So many of you, too, today don't want to go with just one carrier. There's different reasons for that. You want the redundancy in case something happens. But one of the most interesting re relationships or, or deals that Sprint has entered into in the last 12 months was the city of Houston. And they took a completely different approach to it and said that they did want to work with one vendor. Our emergency response team and what we could do should there be a network failure that was due to wireline or something unforeseen kind of solidified that. So they went to a sole source RFP that resulted in Sprint being awarded their business, which results in 10,600 mobile voice devices, which is some feature phones and, and mainly smartphones at this point now, 2,000 mobile broadband cards. Uh, it's, a, it's a typical the, the kind of uh, term contract like you guys have to do, which is a three-year deal, one year with two one-year renewables. We have 800 modems deployed for machine to machine right now for just their parking meter uh, 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 department within the city. And right now we're in communication to deploy more machine to machine with water and wastewater de uh, departments that will be an additional 600 machine to machine connectivity. Uh, so I thought it was a unique deal because not so many big cities or even the smaller entities that we work with across the country go to a sole source and the city of Houston based on the customer care model, the emergency response team, the business continuity, uh, the, the where we scale on the list of green companies in the United States being third in all of the Fortune 500 were a lot of reasons why they chose to go sole source and make us a business partner. So I thought just because of the sheer size of it and everything that it was an interesting scenario to share. Thank you. You'll pass it down to Ed and Paul. Thank you. Yeah, I would say uh, one of the, the most fascinating installations that I think we've done in the last uh, 90 days maybe uh, is putting in a um, what's equivalent to a six cell site DAS in the uh, uh, Panther Stadium in Charlotte. And um, it's, a, it's an awesome uh, first time secure and function. Um, but as far as how that's paid for and who pays for what, again, that's a little bit outside of my uh, bailiwick. But we could probably get you an answer if you had a specific question. With Unlimited, I think uh, Sprint was, you know, always kind of that guy who's still saying, well, I still have an Unlimited. And people said, well, it's because your network isn't so good and people don't want to use it anyway. Well, with Network Vision, I mean, it is something that's fundamentally going to change our network. It's not only going to improve the 3G coverage, it's going to improve our network. It's going to add 800 megahertz. It's going to add 4G LTE to every Sprint cell site by the end of next year. We're maintaining and limited. We need four to five billion dollars to roll this out. Konnichiwa, SoftBank. <laughs> Some of you might know that earlier this week, Sprint had a huge capital investment by an outside Japanese company that sees our vision and sees that we need capital to get there. They see that we need capital to maintain a limited and they're willing to do that. So we're taking $8 billion to continue to invest in network vision, to continue to invest in a limited. Just on the, on the bring your own device, 
Uh, last year, we uh, released an RFP and chose three of our existing business partners, outside companies that do uh, uh, soup to nuts. I just said soup to nuts. You said bailiwick. I said soup to nuts. Uh, mobile device management. So they can do everything from remote wipe to alert people when they start to have overages. But one of the things that I still think is interesting, especially for the people in this room that do manage wireless, and, and I know that I've had a lot of conversations in the past 12 to 24 months about, well, the state's looking at, we just want to give them a stipend, right? The stipend, the stipend. Give them the stipend and we'll wash our hands of this. You guys know because you maintain firewalls and you manage applications and you have to manage a day-to-day -day business that has become so reliant on a commercial network, you will never wash your hands of it. You will always have to be concerned with it. And even if you do let a worker bring his own device, it still will cost you $18 a month. $18 a month in administrative cost, even if he is paying for his own device. And then if you're paying him a stipend on top of that, then you're really back within $5 of where you were when you took advantage of unlimited data plans, of pooling minutes and things like that. So if you, if you want for, uh, and the companies that we deal with are completely carrier agnostic. It's just a service that we talk about and I can introduce you to someone that'll give you a much more thorough presentation if it's something that you're really exploring. Um, we kind of are blurring the lines a little bit between the network and the, the uh, application and device and workplace management. I know I'll talk about this a little bit later because of some of your uh, questions and so forth. But um, the, the device management, what I'm finding is that the customers that I'm talking to have kind of different needs depending on the type of solution that they're trying to implement. In other words, is this something that they're looking to access a database for a particular reason and they need a workspace? that's different on a bring your own device uh, you know, the, for the business versus the personal? Or is it something that they have multiple applications, maybe because they have multiple departments and so forth that need to get in, where that might be a management at the device level and so forth. So um, just so you know, AT&T does have uh, the three out of the top five out of the garden are Magic Quadrant um, folks for mobile device management that we partner with. And we've also developed our own application management product that uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, too. Well, thank you. I'm going to pause the questions for a minute. I'll give you time to address any of the other questions that I had let you had before the meeting. Uh, if you prepare some answers, you can discuss that in a minute. But I want to open it up. Uh, Brandon, could you grab a mic from Dante and help me with the crowd? Um, so raise your hand if you have a question. We're going to, I think the next in turn was Verizon, right, Mark? So we'll start with Mark, but okay, here we go. Let me get the mic so everybody can hear you. You may have kind of alluded to this earlier, but with the exponential growth of tablets, smartphone devices, how do you see your network being able to scale for the number of users that's gonna be coming on in the near future? Then also the second piece of that, for public safety, do you see any kind of committed data rates that you're willing to offer for public safety kind of purposes? Uh, good question. So I think uh, the scale was the first question, um, and I did allude to it, but I didn't speak specifically. We, um, our folks are a little bit obsessive about our network, in case you hadn't figured any of you that have dealt with us have figured out how, uh, how, how we are when it comes to that. So we're constantly monitoring that for a lot of different things, and, and one of those is utilization. How much of that network that's available is being used during the peak hours, and that's kind of what we look at. During the, the highest times that we know this data is here, how much of our network is utilized, and then we manage to that. So we're very aware, just like we all are. I mean, um, when you see it and you live it and breathe it every day, it's a tsunami of data that's coming, and we're all doing everything we know how to do to make sure we're out in front of that. And that goes back to some of the infrastructure stuff we talked about with the uh, making sure we're fully IP, making sure we're fully fiber to the cell sites, that we can manage that. Um, I think in addition to what we're doing today, more and more services are coming. So when you think of things like IMS and other services that are coming, now you're looking at really needing even more and more spectrum, even more and more bandwidth. So um, this is something that's going to continue. We're all, um, we'll be um, running as fast as we can uh, to stay with this as long as we're all in this business. So um, that was the, the first question on scale. And then the, I'm sorry, will you remind me of your second question? Public. The public safety and oh, committed thank you. Committed data, data rates. rates for public safety. So while I don't anticipate committed data rates, 
What we are seeing, um, and it is carrier agnostic, are things like wireless priority service, where um, you can get security from, uh, or clearance from the Department, Department of Homeland Security um, to get prioritized uh, when in an event if, if cell sites are really crowded. Um, will we get to a point where we could dedicate and segment and manage traffic so well that we could look you in the eye and say, I'm gonna guarantee you this much? I think that's, we're working that way, but uh, that's not something that we do today. We do offer the wireless party service as, as we all do. So I'm gonna let Paul answer some questions about the capacity for tablets and things like that, but I know that there are some of you in the room that have we've entered into things where we used to do public safety dispatch and things like that and do committed uh, uh, data rates and voice rates for public safety and would come through your console and be an extension of your existing UHF, VHF, or 800 megahertz radio. We should, by the end of the year, on the Sprint Direct Connect product, have product offering and the capabilities and some really clear checklists and white papers and everything about how we can take that product. Um, pretty much an awesome first time installation uh, for this type of um, installation because it's an outdoor facility, not necessarily an indoor facility. So it's designed to handle just lots of traffic. I couldn't be specific on that, but but I will say that um, it is, uh, it's, it's one of the first in the countries and it's been well accepted and actually got, has gotten great tests over the last uh, uh, several months. And I think Paul wants to talk about something else. Yeah, actually we, uh, uh, I'm a mobility applications consultant, so I talk to a lot of folks across country and we have a deployment in San Diego that I want to mention specific to the police department because they've really bought into the, the fact that it's not about a network, it's not about an application, it's about solving the issues that they have. You know, they had limitations on connectivity back to their databases, to the information that they needed access to, and we were able to solve that. It didn't matter to them how that was solved, they wanted to solve the best. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, we, I have more information on that if we, if we want to share that, but I don't want to take up too much time. So. Um, <clears throat> we have the privilege of having a long list of uh, public safety, local and state government um, customers who we've worked with for a long time. Um, some of the more recent, um, Wake County is a customer who's just um, recently ordered us uh, a large share of their business. We've been long-term partners with uh, both the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. Um, CMPD is one of our oldest relationships all the way back to the days. If there's anybody here that knows what I'm about to say, CDPD, if you ever heard those words, that's, uh, I think that was ancient technology. We were clicking two rocks together to send waves to the air, but um, that's what most of the first responders on. So we, because of that, we've, we've got long-standing relationships. Um, we were also heavily involved in the DNC. That was uh, very um, rewarding, but, but taxing um, project. And I think you're exactly right. I don't know that the city of Charlotte will ever know how fortunate they are to have the infrastructure they have now. Um, it's sort of like the Olympics. Once it's built, it stays there. It doesn't go anywhere, and um, even when the crowds go away. So uh, the customer is the big winner there. Um, uh, I guess kind of moving in, it's, it gets out of, out of the state and local into the municipal. Probably one of the most rewarding products I've had, the, the projects I've had the chance to work on is the, uh, the Smart Grid project with Duke Energy. There's been a lot of publication about that. Um, it's spread across the country. It's just been a, a model for a lot of utilities to look at. It's been very rewarding. And I think the interesting thing is, um, you know, regulation and that type of stuff really drove a lot of pain for these guys. It really put them in a tough spot. And um, building more power plants really was not an option. And their only other option was to figure out how to get more out of what you have. And, I, and uh, to be able to really get into the nitty gritty of how we actually do that live, real time with real customers uh, was very exciting. It was exhausting sometimes. It was a very invigorating project. Um, and so I think there's, there's a, a long list. I won't put you all to sleep here after lunch with, with all of them. But there's a long list of those that, that we're very proud of. Thank you. So if I understand you correctly, it takes a good event to get a, or can take a, a good event to get a good infrastructure. So the U.S. Open is going to be in Pinehurst in there less than two go. years. I'm, I'm going to be watching closely. There's okay. a model here to follow. All right. Our next question, and then we'll open it up to uh, the floor for a few questions. Um, well, future rate plans, this is kind of goes along with where everybody's losing their unlimited data plans. But will future rate plans include an unlimited data plan for government, 
Um, this is particularly important during major events, hurricanes, ice storms, and such, due to our usage going up exponentially. And since we are getting more and more bring your own device requests, are there plans to be able to include government employees under that government umbrella since they will be using their personal devices for government use? We'll start back here with AT&T. Well, I will say to you that, uh, yes, uh, you know, obviously the, the carriers around the country of uh, unlimited data, is, it was a scary thing for most people uh, to see how it would tie up and network. And, and in some cases it did tie up and network uh, early on in, in rollouts of certain devices and such, but not to worry. Um, if you're a government agency, uh, you have the ability to be on a uh, Western States contract and uh, we call it a WISCA 3 contract, and they have unlimited data plans on all those contracts So, uh, with us. So uh, if you're not on it, contact your AT&T rep, and they'll be happy to get you on it. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, as far as BY, uh, BYOD, um, I would say that um, Probably the sharing is probably going to be the answer, the consumer sharing for, for individuals and families uh, from AT&T and, and Verizon as well has that, has that product as well. Um, I think you'll still see some of that unlimited being tied, tied down a little bit to a, a group plan uh, for individuals. But uh, from a government standpoint, uh, a uh, government contract standpoint, we don't have that to worry about in our organization with, uh, with our data plans. Thank you. Um, we have unlimited today for the government as well. Um, will we have it on 4G plans? I mean, just to be honest, I don't know. Um, that happens at a different level than me. Um, we've always partnered with our government uh, customers to try to figure out whatever works best. So. It's, uh, I think it's a definite possibility, but I, I won't even speculate that we will or we won't. Um, I think one of the ways we've tried to address this idea of that we need unlimited, um, most folks, 90%, 95% of the customers on our network never use more than two gig a month. Um, they just really don't. And yeah, <laughs> unless you're Jason's wife, so. Um, but, uh, so we tried to use that, and that's not a written in stone target, but that gives us a place to start, right? And I think we're all trying to figure out how's the best way to move forward. Hey, it's no secret, we are a for-profit company, right? We do need to generate revenue to stay in business. So how do we do that? How do we manage this complete shift in what people want? The whole demand for services is, is not even like it was 18 months ago. So that's shifting, and we're trying to figure it out. Um, and I, I do think that this, the sharing plans that we've all announced um, that's probably a model, it may tweak some, but that's probably a model going forward of what we'll see. Um, as far as BYOD, I don't really know how the plans work. I know BYOD is a, is a question that every enterprise is dealing with today. Um, and there are partners and solutions that can help you allow people to have their devices and keep them back. And not just with an interconnect uh capability but with that more dispatch even though this goes over data instead of a you know 800 megahertz channel that we will be able to start having that conversation again um, as to how we do console integration and increase you know even smartphones in the next year I listen to webinars almost every week about how we'll start to integrate that into public safety communications so we'll continue to stay and Paul's going to talk a little bit about the capacity and the, and the data rates in the ways that are that are um, a little different so, Jason, do you want us to address, each of us to address the question? I the think audience? if we could do it fairly quickly, it would be nice. I didn't say that to start with, but I'm sure there are several other questions, too, from the audience. Perfect. All right. Well, to, to address ongoing data needs, I think we all know that each network has evolutions. And the next network evolution with LTE is LTE Advance. Some people might call that a 5G technology. Let's just go ahead and say it's an incremental advancement over 4G, not a 4G network. Sorry, I had to. So LTE Advance will give you new data rates. I mean, it'll provide for more capacity, more availability over that inter air interface spectrum to allow more and more people on. What Sprint's also doing is in a huge public venue movement to look at the 9,000 public venues across the US, whether they're airports, conventions, hospitals, 
um, you know, all the way down to your NCAA stadiums. What happens at those times when your public safety agencies have to go and respond there, and there's 50,000 people there, and there's not enough capacity to handle it? We already said cities like Charlotte were blessed at Bank of America Stadium where all the carriers went in and put in distributed antenna systems. But these are fundamental problems that Sprint is looking at to address with things not just like distributed antenna systems, but new small cell technology where you can have a small cell of data covering you know, a smaller area, not your typical large uh, macro site that covers 10 square miles, but looking at this small cell technology that can be deployed easily with small backhaul to really fit those high concentration areas for, um, for when that huge capacity comes into place. Now, LT Advance does have some prioritization that can happen with segmenting out different traffic. Still a business case for all carriers at this point to, we know government doesn't like to pay for priority, but they want it. So will that be something that the carriers will develop? It's still something that we have to, I think we all have to look into. Okay, and just to be clear about the 4G network, um, I don't think it's necessarily a negative thing that AT&T is on the GSM technology that LTE is being built on now. That's why we have that 4G, 3G, 2G network in place for that hand down from the LTE speeds so it's a nice, softer landing when you get to areas that don't have that LTE. I just want to address that. Thanks, guys. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that, uh, to address the public safety piece first, uh, because of the type of contract that we have with the government, we actually don't throttle on those unlimited data speeds and so forth. So you do have an advantage there as government entities that um, you won't have to deal with the slowdown that happens on the consumer side. So that's kind of one of the things we do to address that. And as, as far as the, uh, the data network and so forth, um, you know, we obviously are all concerned about kind of making sure that that priority, we all have the wireless priority service and so forth. And there's a lot of interaction that I have with folks from Verizon Sprint in my, in my job because some of my customers are working with other carriers and so forth. I'm still out there to solve an issue. There are things that we can do for emergency notification, for instance, where we actually can prioritize the messages that go out um, over other messages that people might have during a disaster and so forth. So there are lots of things that we can do to address that. Um, and I'll keep it short. Thank you. Uh, question on this side of the room. Anybody? Okay, I got it. Thanks. Uh, so I have a question on the, the prioritization services. Can agencies get, I mean, when we have those big events, can we get reports showing that we were getting that priority? Because uh, I know a recent event like the earthquake, I mean, during that event, for an hour and a half, staff that had even bring your own device, devices, smartphones provided by the carriers to us, you know, we were not able to text, we we're not able to make phone calls. And so, you know, prioritization of service, I mean, that's great, but I mean, how can we truly get the reports showing that we truly got that prioritization through that event? Yeah, there are reports that are available. And you specifically had the wireless priority service in place and so forth? Not with, not with our Pacific agency, but, but it was a congestion of, I think, wireless services, phone services, and, you know, with power outages. I mean, a lot of our, a lot of the cell sites, I mean, I managed to sell, uh, sell carrier license agreements in our, in our area, and most of the sites we have do not have generator backup. And we're trying to work with the carriers to, to get generator backup. But, but during a widespread power outages that last multiple days, I mean, there's got to be some time, downtime, where we're gonna, there's going to have to be a ramp up. And during that time, we, it's critical that, you know, with, with people using more apps, uh, people using more services, our CAD system, you know, it's critical that those services stay up, so. Just to be consistent, let's go ahead with Sprint and then we'll move to at t So wireless priority service right now, from my knowledge, is a voice only. It's, it's when you're making a call through the network, do you get priority so you don't get that all circuits are busy. So it's a voice only right now. And, the advancements in some of the data technologies with being able to set, you know, identify different traffic and segment aren't things going, that are really going to be available until the next iteration of LT Advanced. Um, 
If there's reporting available then, I don't, I don't know that. But that's something that's coming, and that's something there's a possibility for. And I think, of course, that's why it's always being looked at with, um, if that's something I can physically do, or, I mean, I can do in a technology standard, is that something a carrier is willing to implement based on a business case or based on just something that we give to public sector customers like the government and public safety over other people. And I, th I think that's still being looked at at this point from Sprint. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, uh, obviously the priority services is available out there, but, you know, it, 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 as you mentioned, you know, it, it doesn't do you any good if you've got sites that are going down. Now, in our case, you know, it's, and I suspect it's the same with everybody else, uh, you don't have a cell site that just goes down. It's got to go through uh, various uh, <clears throat> step-down procedures. In other words, it's, it's got to go through a series of two hour of battery, battery life uh, in most cases. And, and, and if, you've got a, if you've got a carrier that's, that's maintaining a knock and watching the network all the time, within two hours, if you don't have a generator there, there'll be a generator there. And within two to three hours, if they don't have coverage or you've got capacity issues, there's going to be a cow there. So, um, you know, my suggestion to you, to all of us, I guess, is to stay uh, connected with the different carriers and, and make sure that you have good contacts uh, when those times come, come into play and they can flip the switch and make things happen for you. Yeah, in the interest of time, I'll be real short. I agree. I think those were two great answers, and we're in the same boat. So there's definitely resources at your disposal. Um, just let us know because we're very uh, deliberate about that, and, and uh, very we try to be proactive. So if you're having issues, we can certainly help. Okay, we got time for maybe one more question. Anybody? Okay. So... Um, just in the sake of time, the hotel needs this room emptied fairly quick so we can get ready for tonight. But if you could start, who's next? It was at t Do you want to have three minutes for closing remarks? If you want to address any of the stuff I had listed on questions together, that's fine. Just take a couple minutes here and, and finish up if that's okay. Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say thank you again for coming, and I want you to vote for me on November the 4th. No. <laughs> Um, it did kind of feel like last night for some reason. I'm sorry. He does kind of look like Barack, doesn't he? Yeah, we're kind of going to redo the re debate <laughs> last night. Um, anyway, no, I, I, I would say that, um, you know, AT&T has got a really cool structure as far as handling accounts in North Carolina. We've got, um, we've got accounts in, uh, with us that, that are smaller, medium, and large. And we've got account teams that fall all into those different segments. The lovely Paul here, right here, he handles pretty much all the application stuff for all of North Carolina uh, and uh, works with me as, a, as an account manager for, for the larger accounts and works with our teams for the smaller accounts to help you develop and develop applications for your, for your network help you manage devices better and, um, and control with the B BYOD um, influx or um, that type of thing. We can, we can help you with security issues uh, with that, with Paul. And, um, and I, I just uh, say to you, we have a great government contract that, that is by far the easiest contract that I've ever dealt with over, over time. And, um, you can hop on, hop on, hop on, hop off, excuse me, at will. And um, I would invite you to uh, stop by my booth and talk to me about that if you're not familiar with it. I thank you for letting us be here. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity um, and Jason for setting this up. So I'll take my last couple of minutes to talk about the last question that Jason asked us that we didn't get the answer. And that was, what do you think the next big thing is? Um, we're looking at 3G, we're looking at 4G. What's next? And I really, I see three things that are short term and one that's a little bit longer term. Um, first is, is obviously video. Video is exploding. Um, our kids are gonna laugh at us making voice calls on a phone where you push buttons. 
you know, the way uh, one day because they're going to hit a button and it's going to be an instant video call and that's just going to be the norm. That's just what people assume. And that call while I'm on it is going to follow me, whether I go from my handset, I go to my automobile and the screen there, I go to my television, wherever I am, we're seeing that the technology is, in, is lining up, um, the services are lining up, we've got the bandwidth, we've got the applications, we've got the devices, so we're really seeing this perfect storm line up. So video will be the next big thing. I think that's fairly obvious though. The other thing that we're seeing is because of the 4G networks are, are so pervasive now, um, they're getting so fast, um, cloud is becoming much more mainstream. We're moving into this realm of everything as a service. So whatever it is that you need, um, do I really need um, machines? Do I really need stuff or can I outsource all of that? And we're seeing a lot of companies are looking at that saying, all right, if everything's available as a service, what are the priorities that I keep internally? What are the other priorities that I can actually migrate out to a cloud environment and just pay somebody else as an expense to manage for me? Um, it allows us to, and we're seeing a lot of IT professionals really backing up and focusing in on what are my core competencies and what are my core commitments to this business on this network and let me focus on those and take all the other noise, if you will, and outsource it. Outsource it. And then I think finally, um, we all know that everybody's watching all the time, right? I mean, you can go on Google Maps and you know probably see who's sitting in their car out here in the parking lot for Pete's sakes. It's crazy. Um, the amount of information that's available about every person, about every asset, about every place. And I think the next big land grab, if you will, um, is going to be who is the smartest at collecting, interpreting, and applying all that data that's out there. I mean, if you think about all the things you do on your smartphone, somebody knows what you're doing on that darn thing. Um, and somebody's trying to interpret what that means and what you might do next. Um, so I think the next big thing that we're going to see, as exciting as it sounds, is statistical analysis. Um, we're going to see some of these folks that are really good at that type of stuff break out. And it wouldn't surprise me to see the Googles of the world, the carriers of the world, folks kind of jockeying for who has the best information um, on everybody and who knows how to apply it. So thanks again for um, letting us be here. Um, technology is fun to all of us, as you can, uh, as you can tell by the way we talk about it. So. I, I want to say just thank you. I look around the room and there's a lot of familiar faces. I've been in my job for a long time. So there are, there are past partners and present partners in business. And I've, uh, I've sat down with a lot of you in this room, so I just want to say thank you for, for the time and attention today. Thank you for the past business and the future business that you'll do with us, because I think we'll have a really compelling story to tell in the next 12 to 15 months. I'm, I'm especially interested in some of the things that were discussed about wireless priority, voice priority. So if you guys don't have a GETS card, get one, so at least you can make a voice call um, and when you respond to disasters and you have something happen in your community. Um, I also, you know, the, 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 the couple things that are near and dear to me are uh, two accolades to Sprint with our customer care model and with our sustainability model. Those are the two things that I feel like sustainability being the next big thing. As we have continued to receive accolade after accolade for our sustainability and for our green, you know, the greenness of the company, these things will start to apply to your business as well. So those are conversations I look forward to having whether that's machine to machine applications or the work from anywhere, the things that we'll start to do. It's not just elimination of paper, right? It's a, it's a complete adaptation of doing things a different way. I think that's the next big conversation that we'll have about how wireless um, can start to help our government and our enterprise customers uh, move in that direction because it's important to all of us. And with that, I'll just say thank you. And if you um, want to get with any of us, I'm sure we'll be happy to talk to you. If more questions, do follow up meetings or whatever you want us to do. And thank you, Jason. Okay, let's uh, let's give them a hand. Hey, clap. They they have really busy schedules. Their business is very competitive, and I really appreciate you guys coming and spending this hour with us. Okay.